Well, let's pray, shall we? Father, you and you alone have a good design for the salvation of the lost, and it culminates in your Son. Lord, his earthly ministry that was 2,000 years ago is to be followed by his return and his kingly reign on this earth. And Lord, we love to think about such things. Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight as we examine your word. Lord, that first and foremost, we would do so in a way that would bring honor and glory to you. Lord, as you make clear to us your plan to establish your son on this earth. So Lord, we pray that you would equip us, you would give us everything we need to comprehend your word. And then, Lord God, you would grant us your grace to live in light of that truth. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, welcome tonight to uh, our second to the last edition of our 66 books, the first of which are the Old Testament. And so we'll be here in the book of Zechariah tonight. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Zechariah. And uh, Zechariah is the second to the last of the minor prophets. And it completes and it continues a theme that's been running through many of the minor prophets. And that is that Israel has been entrenched in their sin. They were taken away into exile. And here in the later books of the minor prophets, uh, the the question comes into view of, of what is going to take place in the future for Israel. And in light of that, what must they be doing right now? Zechariah's book is no different to that, and it's very important for us to take a look at what the name Zechariah actually means. This is really, really helpful, because when we look at this, we can see what it is that God is doing. The Hebrew word zakar means to remember, to remember. And so zakar yah means yah, or Yahweh, remembers. So Zechariah's name means that God remembers. And what God remembers is he remembers his covenant promises to Israel, those that he made to Abraham back in Genesis 12 through 15. He said, I will give you this land. And not only will I give you this land, but I will give you many, many descendants. And then beyond that, all of the nations will be blessed through your seed. So the story of Zechariah is how God is going to reveal the details of exactly what he will do to bring that about. So Zechariah was born in Babylon, probably during the exile. And he is listed in Nehemiah as one of the priests who returned from Babylon. So he was both a prophet and a priest. And it's important for us to understand that Zechariah's writings were contemporary to those of Haggai, which we heard about recently. In fact, they begin two months after Haggai's writing. So if you have your Bibles, just turn a couple of pages to the left and look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, So this is year two, month number six of the reign of Darius. And then we flip back to Zechariah, chapter one, verse one. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius. So what we have here is year two, month eight, just two months after the message from Haggai. So it's important for us to see that because we know that Haggai's message was to Israel, you need to repent and you need to rebuild the temple. And Zechariah's message is going to follow right in line with that. Quick timeline of where we are in history. We know this, but a good review is helpful. Right around the year 600, there were three deportations, 600 BC, of Judah into Babylon. They were there for 70 years. 539 BC, Cyrus conquers Babylon. 538, Judah returns to the promised land. And then they begin to uh, rebuild the temple. 522 to 486, Darius is the king and he reigns during that time. And that is the time when Zechariah's prophecy actually begins. And then uh, quite a while after that in 484 and following for another few years after that, Xerxes reigns. And so most of the, the writing at the beginning of the book takes place very, very early on in the reign of Darius, about 520 BC. And Greece as a country is mentioned in chapter nine. So it gives us reason to believe that the latter part of the book was written much later because Greece wasn't yet a prominent power in 520 BC. What we want to take a look at here, if you have your Bibles, just flip over to Ezra chapter two and go to the very end of the chapter and look at verse 64. And this will give us an idea of how many people actually returned to Judah from Babylon in exile. Ezra chapter two, verse 64. 
tells us that the whole assembly numbered 42,360. So in 538 BC, 42,000 Jews returned from exile in Babylon. And very shortly after that, they began to rebuild the temple. But we know that they ran into some opposition from the surrounding nations, from the people who were actually living there. And so the Jews gave up. And for 16 years, the progress on rebuilding the temple had come to an end. And it sat there unfinished. So the message of Haggai is going to be very clear when we look at one more passage outside of uh, the message of Zechariah clear, when we look at one more passage outside of Zechariah, and that's in Ezra chapter 5. We're going to look at Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This will help us understand how it is that Zechariah and Haggai are working together in this. Ezra chapter 5. When the prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah, and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel and Yeshua arose and began to rebuild the temple of the house of God. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So Haggai and Zechariah are together. They're working together. They are encouraging. They are exhorting the people of Israel. And they had very different and distinct roles. Haggai's role was to say, repent from your sin and get started on rebuilding this temple. You have to do that. So they did. It was sort of a kick in the pants to Israel. Zechariah comes along and he has the same message. Repent from your sin. But his message is a little different following that. I'm going to encourage you to continue working on the rebuilding of the temple. And you need to continue rebuilding the temple with the knowledge that the Messiah will one day come and dwell in this land. So Haggai is getting them started to rebuild the temple. And Zechariah is providing encouragement to continue through that time. And the message of Zechariah is this, Yahweh remembers his covenant promises and he will keep them. He will absolutely keep his covenant promises. Now this story here contains fantastic realities of the future. And these are the kind of realities that would sober anybody into motivating them to live a life of holiness. So it's no surprise that the book starts with a call to Israel to leave their spiritual indifference. These are people who had just very recently begun to rebuild the temple. So Zechariah first starts his letter by saying, I need to call you out of your indifference. And so we'll see that in the first six verses of chapter 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah the prophet, saying, Yahweh was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says Yahweh of hosts, return to me that I may return to you. So the way the whole book starts is Zechariah is reminding Israel of their fathers, their sinful fathers who lived before the exile and God's anger with them. And God's command to this current generation that is dealing with Zechariah, he says to them, return to me. Verse 4, he says, do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. They did not listen or give heed. And then in verse 5, we see where their own wisdom and their own self-rule took them. Your fathers, where are they? Did not my words overtake your fathers? Then they repented. The overall message here is that comfort is coming to those uh, who are obedient and who, who, those who obey. But first, you must repent. You people need to repent. So the backdrop of this book is one of comfort for those who are repentant. And this book is going to come in three parts, really. The first opening part is a book of, that contains eight visions, eight separate visions. And then beyond that, there is a series of four messages that come right after the eight visions. And the purpose of those messages is to expose Israel's spiritual indifference. And then at the very end of the book, for six chapters, uh, Isaiah or Zechariah writes very heavily and very certainly about two different burdens. And the first of those burdens is about Messiah Jesus and how he is rejected by his people. And the second of those burdens, those writing, is about Messiah Jesus and how he will be exalted. So let's start by looking at these eight visions, and then we'll move on to the other parts of the book. We start in chapter 1, verse 7. And we look back at, again at verse 1 of chapter 1. It's the uh, second year in the eighth month. Now, we're, by the time we get to verse 7, we're a little farther along on the 24th day of the 11th month in the second year of Darius. So now we're in the 11th month. This is three or four months ahead. 
And this is on the front end of these eight separate visions. What we wanna do here before we actually get started with the visions is look at the way they all start. So right there in verse eight, Zechariah says in the first vision, I saw at night. So it's nighttime and he sees. And then in verse 18, the next vision, then I lifted my eyes and looked. Chapter two, verse one, then I lifted my eyes and looked. Chapter three, verse one, then he showed me Joshua. Chapter four, then the angel returned. Chapter five, then I lifted my eyes again. Chapter five, verse five, then the angel who was speaking with me went out. Chapter six, verse one, now I lifted my eyes again and looked. So he starts by saying, I saw at night, and then you read then, 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 then. What that tells us is that all of these visions, one follows right after the next. Zechariah very likely saw them all in the same night, in the 11th month, in the year 520 BC. That's very helpful for us. We wanna make sure that we understand the difference between a vision and a dream as we look at this. A vision is something that takes place when the person is awake. They are fully conscious, they are fully comprehending of what is around them, but they are awake. And they're experiencing something and they see something and they understand something that those around them do not see. And that's different from a dream where a person is asleep and they're unconscious. Zechariah is absolutely awake and conscious for all of these eight visions. So we need to keep that in mind as we're, we're reading through them. So in the first vision, we have this man who is among the myrtle trees, starting in verse seven. In verse eight, Zechariah says, I saw at night and behold, a man was riding on a red horse and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine with red sorrel and white horses behind him. So in this vision, it's important for us to identify who the players are. And we have these red sorrel and white horses first and those who are riding on them. In verse 10, we come to understand a little bit more about these who are riding on these horses. These are those whom Yahweh has sent to patrol the earth. Verse 11, we see a little bit more about them. These are ones who answer to the angel of Yahweh. So the Lord has sent them. Therefore, they are there to carry out God's purposes and they answer to the Lord. Well, we know one being, we know one creature that does that. Those are angels. They are the ones that God sends. Then we have the man who's riding on a red horse and that horse is standing among these myrtle trees. Verse 11, we, we see a little bit more detail about who that man is. They answered, the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees. Zechariah tells us who he is. He's the angel of the Lord. We're going to see a little further on in verse 12 how he very likely could be the pre-incarnate Christ. And then we'll take a look at these myrtle trees that he's standing amongst. A myrtle tree is a common tree in the promised land, especially uh, in and around Jerusalem. It's not a big, impressive tree. It doesn't have this big stout trunk. It doesn't have this broad root system, but it is an attractive tree and it has a very pleasant aroma. And when you break a branch and expose the inner parts of the tree, it gives off a very pleasant aroma. Verse eight tells us that this, these trees, this bunch of trees is growing in a ravine. And so what this could represent and very likely does represent is the people of Israel especially those that are back from the exile. A group of people who are not impressive to look at, a group of people who don't have a lot of strength, but God considers them very, very pleasant to himself because of his covenant promises to them. And so what happens? In verse 10, we see that the angels have patrolled the earth and they answer in verse 11 to the angel of the Lord who is standing among the myrtle trees and they say, we have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. So we have to ask ourselves what this means. What does it mean that all the earth is peaceful and quiet? Well, it means that all of Israel's nature's neighbors are indifferent to Israel's situation. This is a small beleaguered group of 42,000 people who is coming back to inhabit their country and their country is in ruins. And there is nobody around them who is willing to help them. There is nobody around them who is willing to come to their aid. What's probably happening is these people are affording opposition to them. But then we see God's response to them, and we'll get to that in just a bit, but we see verse 12. The angel of Yahweh said, O Yahweh of hosts, how long will have you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with which you have been indignant these 70 years? So we have the angel of Yahweh 
saying, O Yahweh of hosts. If this were just any other angel, he wouldn't be addressing the Lord of hosts in this way because we know that any other angel is just a messenger. His function is to message. He performs other tasks, but he doesn't address and question Yahweh himself. Good reason to believe that we may be dealing with incarnate Christ here. And remember, it's good for us to consider that Judah has been downtrodden for these 70 years, and they're coming back. And so we see in verses 14 and 15, God's heart for his people. And this is where a message of comfort starts to come. In the middle of the verse, God says, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I'm very angry with the nations who are at ease. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. So God had a design for Israel while they were in Judah, while they were in Babylon in exile. And that design was that they would repent from their sin and they would begin to prosper as a people and they would prepare themselves for the return because God told them you will be returning in 70 years. So go to Babylon and get ready to return and get back here and be successful in the tasks I have for you to display my name to the rest of the nations. That was God's design for them. He was only a little angry with them, so he exiles them away so they could recover and come back. But what happened in exile, we read here, is that they, Babylon, other nations as well, furthered the disaster. Babylon went far beyond what God had intended for them to do in his use of them. So what's God's response to that? We see it in verse 16. I will return with compassion. My house will be built in it. That's in the land. A measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem and Yahweh will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. These are comforting words to those in Judah. Downtrodden Judah is not making a ton of progress on rebuilding the temple. They're rebuilding it and it's going forward and it's nothing like the original temple and they're being mistreated by their enemies and God says, I am jealous for you. Be faithful, finish rebuilding the temple and one day a perfect temple will be built where you will worship me. So that's God's message of comfort. We're going to move through the remaining seven visions a little more quickly, but it's important for us to understand the starting point and that is that God is comforting his people Yes, they need to repent. They need to turn from their sin. This is a message of comfort. We'll see that in the second vision, which is in verses 18 to 21. He sees this vision, and it's immediately following the first. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. And again, Zechariah really doesn't know what this is, so he asks, and the angel speaking with me says, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. We know this. A horn represents strength. These are the nations who in their strength have scattered Israel far and wide. Israel has no residence in the promised land. They had no temple worship. They had no usefulness to God at that time. All of this needed to be restored. They were a pitiful sight to look at. But God's response is in verse 20. Then Yahweh showed me four craftsmen. And again, here is Judah, and they are at the mercy of the strong nations around them. God says in verse 21, these four craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. That's comforting news. That's really, really comforting news. So God is saying, when a nation rises up against you, it rises up against you to mistreat you, know that I will utilize these four craftsmen to throw them down. He doesn't provide much more detail on that at this time. But Israel can take great comfort in knowing that when they find opposition, that one day God will conquer their enemies. That's really encouraging news to this people who is back in their promised land and they don't have much to work with. So what God does next is he begins to tell them about the city of Jerusalem itself. And we see that in the third vision, Jerusalem without walls, verses 1 through 13 in chapter 2. So Zechariah sees a man with a measuring line in his hand. And he asks, where is that man going? And we learn in verse 2 that he's going to measure Jerusalem. And here the angel who has been with Zechariah speaks to a second angel. There's another angel who comes into the picture. And the second angel says to that first angel, tell that young man, and that young man is Zechariah, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and the cattle within it. So here there's this beleaguered band of 42,000 people and they get this message that says, there won't be enough space to hold these people, so we have to build this new city that won't have any walls. 
And then there's a message of comfort. We see that in verses 5 through 8. For I declare Yahweh will be a wall of fire around her. This is so encouraging to Judah because when they think, oh, let's build a city without walls, that means a city with no protection. Yahweh is saying, I will be your protection. I will also be the glory in her midst. And in verses 6 and 7, he says to those who are spread far and wide, flee from the land of the north. Escape you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. So leave Babylon. Verse 8, thus says Yahweh of hosts, after glory he has sent me against the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. So God is saying, Judah, I am going to summon you from the nations far and wide. And when I do that, I will restore you to your land. And the reason why I'm going to do this is because when they touch you, they will touch the apple of my eye. When they mistreat you, God is saying they're actually mistreating me. If we think about our eye, our eye is the most sensitive part of our body. God is not actually speaking about the people of Judah here when he's saying when they mistreat you, they mistreat the apple of my eye. He's not saying you are the apple of my eye. Yes, you are chosen. But he is saying when they mistreat you, that is an offense to me. I find that very offensive. I find that repulsive. It's an offense against me. And that is encouraging to Israel to know that when they are mistreated, that makes God very, very angry. And he closes with more comforting words. In verse 12, he says that Yahweh himself will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and he will again choose, Jeru Judah, he will choose Jerusalem. And so now Israel can know this. And this is really encouraging for Israel, that God will one day restore them to the promised land, and he will choose them personally. That is his choice. So now they know that they've got a city, they've got a promised land, we see another vision here that helps them understand how God is going to address their sin. And we see that in the beginning of chapter 3. And the context here is, again, that Israel is in the promised land, and they're starting to rebuild the temple, but their sin really hasn't been addressed at a whole level yet. They're still a sinful people, and, and God is not going to act on their behalf in the future until they are a righteous people. So God tells them exactly how he's going to accomplish that in chapter 3. And it's the next vision, and again, it's the same night. In verse 1, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of Yahweh and Satan is standing at his right hand to accuse him. So there's Joshua the high priest and there is Satan right at the next time accusing him. And Yahweh says to Satan, Yahweh rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Joshua is a representative of who Israel is. We see that in verse 9. Behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares Yahweh of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. This is God saying, I am going to make this a holy nation, a holy people. I will remove their sin in one day. I will purify Israel at a national level, and I'll do that in preparation for their residence in the promised land. So now they understand that God is going to be dealing with their sin. And the next vision helps us understand how God is going to enable them when they're in that promised land. And we see a vision of the lampstand and the olive trees in chapter 4. And the angel says to him, what do you see? And he said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold. And it's bowl on top of it and it's seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps and two olive trees by it, one on the right side and the other on the left. And again, Zechariah doesn't know the meaning of this vision. He doesn't understand it. So the angel tells him, he says to me in verse 6, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by my might, nor by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The picture here is that God is providing the means, and he's providing the mechanism to keep the lamps lit. And there is no human agency involved in keeping these lamps lit. Up until that time, prior to the exile, the priests did all the work of trimming the wicks, mainly making sure there was oil in there, keeping those lamps burning because they were supposed to be burning all the time. But God is saying, I will do the work for this. I will provide the mechanism for this. I will provide the design. There are these olive trees at the side and they are going to be continually providing the oil. And there are these lamps and they will be continually burning. This is what the Father says in Isaiah 49, verse 6. This is what he says um, 
speaking to his son, Messiah Jesus. He says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones to Israel? I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. God is going to provide Judah with Jesus himself. Jesus will be the light. Jesus himself will be that light and he will be a light to the nations. And God will give Israel the Holy Spirit in abundant measure dwelling within them. And that will enable them to display that light of Christ to the nations around them. So now Israel understands how it is that God is going to provide for them. He's going to remove their sin. And here is going to provide the means for them to represent him well to the nations around them. And then in the next vision, we see how God is going to address sin worldwide. He sees his sixth vision. It's in chapter 5. He sees a flying scroll. And it's helpful to read verses 1 through 3 in their entirety to give us a clear picture of what's actually taking place here. Zechariah writes, Then I lifted my eyes again, and I looked. And behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, What do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, This is the curse that is going over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side, and everybody who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. So here is the judgment of the sinner. Zechariah sees this scroll. Its dimensions are 20 cubits by 10 cubits. This is identical in dimension to the holy place in the temple. And so what we can conclude from this, and there's writing on both sides of this, and this is God's holy law standing in judgment against man's sin. And this scroll will have its judgment over all of mankind. And we see the scope of that in verse 3. This is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. The word here, Eretz, means either land or earth. And most commentators are telling us that this is the word earth, that this judgment is going across, across the whole earth, not just localized to Judah. So it's going across through the whole earth. And we see God's judgment in verse 4. I will make it go forth, declares Yahweh of hosts, and it will enter the house of the thief and the house who, of the one who swears falsely by my name. We know that all sin is ultimately against God, but here what Zechariah is seeing is something that is a sin that's manifested as an outward level. At an outward level, stealing is a sin against man. At, at an outward level, swearing falsely by God's name is a sin against God. And so God is saying, I will judge all of man's sin. I will judge the sin that outwardly is a sin against man, and I will judge the sin that outwardly is a sin against me. And the rest of verse 4 tells us exactly how it is that God will do that. He says, This scroll will spend the night within that house, and it will consume it, its timber and stones. So God will completely the, obliterate those who reject and ignore his law. We back up to verse 3, we see the reason why. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side, and everybody who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. Judah was taken into exile because of their idolatry. If you look back at the history of Israel right before the exile, again and again in Ezekiel and in other pre-exilic books, what you see is that they are an idolatrous people. But the idolatry went away in Babylon. When they come back from Babylon, you really don't read about much idolatry in the nation of Israel. But something else has taken place, and that was something that they picked up while they were in Babylon, that they brought back with them. And that was a worldliness and a materialism. It was the lifestyle and the materialism of that within Babylon. And God is saying in the future times, in the future time, I will judge the sin in that place. We go on and we read another vision where Zechariah sees a woman in a basket in verses 5 through 11. He says to the angel, what is this? In verse 6, the angel said, this is the ephah going forth, and this is their appearance in all the land. And the lid was lifted, and this is a woman inside of the ephah. She's sitting inside the ephah. And ephah was a unit of measure, and it was about eight gallons. And this measure was the largest unit of measure in Jewish culture. They didn't have anything bigger than that to describe. 
So there was no way to quantify anything that was larger than an ephah. It's sort of like our word for tons. If someone says, well, how many people were at the party? You say, well, there were tons of people. That's a, a term that we use to say there were lots and lots and lots. When people look at that, they say there's lots of people. The term ephah is used to say there was so much of it here that it really couldn't be overlooked. And verse 6 at the end tells us it was in all of the land. And we're going to see in verse 8 what it was that, that is in all of the land. But first we see in verse 7 that there's a woman sitting inside it. A person would fill up an ephah if they were sitting inside a, a container that holds about eight gallons. They would fill it up. And the idea there is that what you see in verse 8 is going to fill up the thing to its fullest capacity, which you see in verse 7. And what it is in verse 8 is wickedness. Israel's present sin, and in the millennial kingdom, the sin of the world, will have reached its full capacity. If you think carefully about what you read when you read the book of Revelation, what you read is, uh, when you get to chapter 18, is a description of the sin that's in the world, and you see this materialism that you can't miss. Just turn to Revelation chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 11 through 13. We're not going to read them in their entirety. But what you see there is a list. You see a very long list of all of the different ways in which the world is putting its materialism on display. I'll read verse 11. And the merchants of the earth are weeping and mourning. They're mourning over the loss of Babylon because no one buys their cargoes anymore. So the world system of commerce has been torn down. And what does it consist of? Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones. There is a very long list, a list of 28 different items that characterize the materialism that's in the world. So you get the idea that the world is full of materialism. That tells us what will be the play taking place in the future. And that's what Zechariah is telling in this vision he's seeing in this vision. This woman has wickedness that has filled up this ephah, this largest measure that they have, and it's full of wickedness. And you can see God's response to this in verse 8b at the end of the verse. The angel throws the woman down into the middle of the ephah and casts the lead weight on top of its opening. That is telling us that there will be a time when God will put an end to the materialism of this world. And then Zechariah sees his eighth and his final vision in chapter 6. And what this is, is a story of how God is going to judge the world and set up his millennial kingdom. And it really comes in two pieces. And in the first piece, you have the defeat of the enemy, and then you have Christ being put on his throne. The first piece starts in verse 1. I lifted up my eyes again, and I looked, and behold, four chariots were coming forth from between the two mountains. And Zechariah again asks, well, what are these? And the angel replied, and he said, These are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before Yahweh of all the earth. And Yahweh said, Go patrol the earth. So they did. That's verse 7. Then Yahweh himself cries out to Zechariah, and he says, See, those who are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath. The testimony of God himself is that his agents have appeased his wrath. There's no more detail given, just that his wrath is appeased. And that's all that needs to be said about the enemy. If God's wrath is appeased against them, then the enemy cannot and cannot any longer carry out his schemes. So what that represents is an enemy who's no longer able to operate, no longer able to accomplish what he intends to because God's wrath on him has been appeased. So that's the first piece. And then the second piece is in verses 10 to 15, and it's a word from Yahweh. It's not a vision, it's God speaking. We see that in verse 9. The word of Yahweh also came to me, saying, and we're going to jump down to verse 11. Take silver and gold and make an ornate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and then say to him, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch. For he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of Yahweh. So these exiles are to take and they are to make a crown. But they're to make a crown of two components. And those two components, we see them right there, they're silver and gold. And they are to put that crown, which is made of two different components, on the head of Joshua the priest. And this is really, really significant because this crown that is made of two elements indicates that the one who wears that crown will actually occupy two different offices. And those two offices are the office of king and the office of priest. And in verse 10, or sorry, 12, tells us exactly who that is, who will wear that crown. And that is the man whose name is Branch. 
Jesus, the only one who can serve both as priest, an atoning sacrifice for all of those who have put their trust in him, and as king, the Messiah who's ruling over his creation. So Zechariah sees eight visions, and they all fit together to tell a story. What we want to do right now is just provide a quick summary of what those eight visions are and a rough approximation of what they mean. The first vision, again, is the man in the myrtle trees. And the meaning there is that God is very jealous for his people. God is jealous for them. Then you have the four horns and the craftsmen. God will conquer Israel's enemies. Then you have the, the vision of Jerusalem without walls. God will restore Israel to the promised land and it will be full of people. And then you have Joshua the priest. God will purify Israel from their sin. You have the golden lampstand. God will pour out his Holy Spirit on them. You have the flying scroll that God will judge and put an end to sin. Verse, uh, vision number seven, the woman in the basket. God will put an end to that worldly sin of materialism. And then vision eight, God will defeat the enemy of, of Israel and he will establish Christ. So these eight visions. Does that sound familiar when you think of a sequence that starts with God recovering his people and ending with exalted Christ? When you read your, your Bible and you're in the book of Revelation and you read chapters 6 through 19, you see many, many, many of these same elements taking place. So God is giving Judah a picture of how future Messiah will come to reign on this earth. But before we move on, God has to address Israel in their day. And there are some of the things that they really need to work on. And we're going to see that in chapters 7 and 8. And there's four messages here. And they start in the fourth year of King Darius. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month. So now we're on year four of Darius. This is two years later. So the visions were given two years earlier in year two, month eight. So here we are two years and a month later. And the setting is the temple rebuild has been going on and things are going pretty well. And we see here that some men come to talk to Zechariah. And it's very revealing from what they ask him, what the state of Israel really is. Verse 2, chapter 7. Now the town of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regemelech and their men to seek the favor of Yahweh, speaking to the priests who belonged to the house of Yahweh of hosts, and to the prophets, saying, Shall I weep in the fifth month and abstain as I have done all these years, these many years? So these are men who have returned from the exile, and they are looking for a favorable answer from Zechariah. And what they're saying is, do we really need to keep the, the fast of the fifth month? We've got this fast going that we started. Do we really need to keep that going? And God answers with four declarations to them. We see the first one starting in verse 4. It's going to go through verse 7. And God says, you need to end your vain worship. Verse 4. The word of Yahweh of hosts came to me, Zechariah, saying to all the people of the land and the priests, say to them, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, all these 70 years, that's their exile, was it actually for me that you fasted? And God doesn't wait for an answer. He tells them the condition of their hearts. He moves away from their fasting and he talks to them about their feasting. And this feast was intended to be a time of honoring the Lord at the end of a fast. And it was supposed to mark the end of the fast. So it was something to point the focus on the fast. But God says, when you eat and drink, do you not eat for yourselves and do you not drink for yourselves? He's saying this fast was devoid of spiritual purpose. And so was your feasting. Your feasting and your fasting this whole time has been on yourselves. I desire that you revere me. So end your vain worship. And he tells them then, what you need to do is you need to repent today. We see that in verses 8 through 14, and we'll look at verse 9. Thus it said, Yahweh of hosts, dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. God is saying, demonstrate my merciful character to yourselves and to the pagan world around you. In verse 10, he says, do not oppress the widow or the orphan or the stranger or the poor. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. God is saying, don't even think about exploiting the weaknesses of the widow and the orphan, the stranger, that's the alien, or the poor. These are the very people that God sent them there to help. 
and that they would reflect God's character to the pagans around them. God's design for them was when you see people who are in these categories, you are to help them. You are to make accommodations for them. You're to assist them. And God says, don't even think about exploiting their weaknesses. God says, forget about your vain feasts. That's only a form of religion. Instead, I'm interested in your heart. I want you to repent today. And I want you to not even think about how you can exploit others. I want you to honor me. And then he tells them in chapter 8, you need to prepare for a future restoration. And that's in the first 17 verses. And again, it's the same time frame. It's two years after the reconstruction began. In verse 3, he says, Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of Yahweh of hosts will be called the holy mountain. God is speaking of a time of future prosperity, and we see more of that in verses 4 and 5. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of age, and the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the streets. So he's telling them there is a time of peace coming. There is a time of safety coming. So, in verse 9, let your hands be strong. You who are listening in these days to these words from the mouth of the prophets, those who speak in the day of the foundation of the house of Yahweh of hosts was laid, let your hands be strong to the end that the temple might be built. So prepare for the future. I'm going to bring about this restoration so that you can worship me. If you're going to worship me then, you need to worship me now. So continue the work on this temple. Be a people who's worshiping me already. And then he gets to the last of his messages, and he says this needs to be true worship. Not the vain worship we talked about back in verse 7. God will give them a heart for true worship, and we see that in verse 19. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth month, will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. So love, truth, and peace. And with that heart, they will be a light to the nations that God has intended them to be all along. He's going to say, participate in the fasts, participate in the feasts, and do it with joy, do it with gladness, because of what they represent, where the focus is. The focus is on God, not on us. In verse 20, thus says Yahweh of hosts, In those days, ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The way that other people are going to hear that God is with them is because they are already worshiping God in truth. They are performing true worship and giving true worship unto God, and the world is going to hear about it and know about it, and they're going to want to come and see and be a part of it. So worship me in truth. Have true worship. So he gives them all those things because they need to have a right understanding of what is coming for the Messiah. And we're going to see two burdens. And a burden, again, is a very heavy oracle, a very heavy statement, and a very weighty statement. And Jesus is in view here for all of these things. And the first burden is for Jesus as a suffering servant. And the second one is going to deal with Jesus as the Messiah. So in chapter 9, the burden of the word of Yahweh is against some people. We see that God is against the nation of Damascus. In verse 2, you see he's against Tyre and Sidon. In verses 3 and following, he's against Philistia. He's against all of the nations that are around them. And then he has a foretelling of the Messiah's coming. Verse 19, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter in Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, a foal of a donkey. This is, again, in Zechariah's time, this is a view towards the future. And the future that is in mind here is Jesus' earthly ministry. He's coming on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. When he comes for his millennial kingdom in the future for us now, way in the future, he's coming on a white horse. Here, he's on a donkey, on a colt. He's coming very humble. Chapter 10, we read about God's future blessings on the northern and the southern kingdoms. And in chapter 11, we see what will happen between now and then. Look at verses 4 and 5 of chapter 11. Thus says Yahweh, my God, pasture the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them slay them and go unpunished. And each of those who will sell them says, blessed be Yahweh, for I have become rich. 
and their own shepherds have no pity on them. Zechariah says here, thus says Yahweh, my God. And he's speaking about people who are living sinfully here. And you see that in verses four and five. God tells Zechariah to shepherd the flock of Israel. And Zechariah here in his day is to provide shepherding over Israel as a picture of the kind of shepherding that Jesus will provide in his earthly ministry. So in verse 7, at the beginning of the verse, Zechariah says, So I pastured the flock doomed to slaughter, hence the afflicted of the flock. This current flock is doomed to slaughter. And the immediate Old Testament context in verse 5 is that some of those people are being sold into slavery. You see that when you look back. Those who buy them slay them and go unpunished. And each of those who sells them says, Blessed be Yahweh. So you have people in the land, some of them are Jews, some of them are foreigners, and they are selling God's people into slavery to nations around them. And they're profiting from it. If you look at the end of verse 5, when they profit from it, they thank the Lord for that profit of selling people into slavery. That is all crooked and twisted. They've got it all wrong. They misunderstand what a blessing is. Joel chapter 3 tells us that the nations north of Israel, Tyre and Sidon, they were selling God's people into slavery to the Greeks. But the main emphasis here is on Christ and his earthly ministry. And we see that in verse 7 at the end of the verse. So Isaiah, or Zechariah says, I took for myself two staffs, the one I called favor and the other I called union. So I pastured the flock. So he's got these two staffs, favor and union. His ministry of favor is protection for Israel from its enemies. And his ministry of union is to bind Israel together. But Zechariah breaks both of these. He breaks the stick called favor. There's no longer any protection for Israel from its enemies. We know that in the year AD 70, Herod's temple was destroyed. And people were overrun. Israel was overrun. Union was broken as well. Israel and Judah no longer enjoy this this unity that they have, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom today. No one can really speak of it. It's been separated and it's been broken. And then we see Judas' betrayal of Jesus foretold in verse 12. I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then Yahweh said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of Yahweh. We know that Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Matthew's gospel tells us in chapter 28 that this was the price of a slave. So Jesus was betrayed for a small, puny, pitiful amount of money. And after realizing what he did, Judas throws that money into the temple. So verse 12 of chapter 11 is a foretelling of how it is that Jesus will be betrayed. So Zechariah tells Israel how they will betray their own Messiah. And he doesn't describe the crucifixion here, but he references it a little later in chapter 13, and we'll get there. He closes his section here with a judgment against Israel's spiritual leadership, and we see that in verses 15 to 17 of chapter 11. Yahweh said to me, take again for yourself the equipment of a foolish shepherd. So what's in view here are foolish shepherds. Behold, I am going to raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for the perishing. He will not seek the scattered. He will not heal the broken or sustain the one standing, but he will devour the flesh of the fat sheep and tear off their hoofs. God is saying he's going to raise up one who will do that. In the near term, that's the foolish Pharisees. They were the worst possible religious leadership Israel could have. That was in the intertestamental time that they started to come into prominence in Jesus' earthly ministry. But in the far term, he's speaking to the Antichrist, and we see that in verse 17. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword will be on his arm and on his right eye. His arm will be totally withered and his right eye will be blind. Revelation tells us that the Antichrist will deceive the nations around him by feigning some sort of wound and providing himself and presenting himself as having recovered from that wound and will perform what appear to be many miraculous signs, but all of it will ultimately be for the purpose of destroying Israel. 
So God is telling Israel, you're going to have some foolish shepherds. You're going to have some in the near term, and you're going to have some at the end of the age. That's really sobering. That's a heavy message. But the last three chapters speak of the conquering king. And this is the message of encouragement that Israel needs to keep. We see it in chapters 12 through 14. And all of this takes place on the day of the Lord. And it's a day when God avenges himself against all of the world's offenses against him. And so the context here is that the whole world is opposed to God's people. And God starts by addressing Israel's enemies. And we see that in chapter 12, going through the first nine verses of chapter 13. These are the nations of the world laying siege against Israel. Chapter 12, verse 1, the burden of the word of Yahweh concerning Israel. Again, this is something that is really, really heavy and weighty. So we don't want to blow right by it. There is a siege against Israel by all the nations, and we see that in verse 2. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. So God is going to make them a cup that causes reeling. But look at how he does it. When the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. So God is going to cause Jerusalem and Judah to be a stumbling block to all the other nations, a cause of reeling. But they're going to do so by laying siege against Jerusalem. Notice who's controlling all things in verse 3. I will make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling. That's God speaking. I will strike every horse. I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot among the pieces of wood. In verse 7, Yahweh will save the tents of Judah. Yahweh will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The nations in their wisdom are doing what they think they should do. They are going to lay up a siege against Jerusalem. And they are thinking that in doing so, they will destroy Jerusalem. And this is going to be a massive gathering of people, a massive, massive, massive siege. And you've got this little group of people in Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 9, verse 16 tells us that the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. So this is a massive army, but they are playing directly into God's hands. This is God's means of gathering them together. This is how God gathers the nations so that he can avenge himself against them. And he's going to do it in the last day. So you see all of Israel's enemies, and then you see Israel's grief. And this is when you see the Isaiah 53 moment, and you see it in verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. So they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Future Israel will finally see Jesus with clarity. They will finally understand the one whom they pierced. They will know that their ancestors, their fathers did this. And this is godly sorrow. You notice they will weep bitterly over him. They're going to be pierced to the quick when they realize what their fathers did. So that's Israel's grief. And then you see Israel's rescue. You see the way that Messiah comes in and actually rescues them. And you see it in verse 13. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David for sin and impurity. This is where the washing of sin takes place, the washing away. Verse 2, it will come about in that day that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they will no longer be remembered and I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirits from the land. God is going to wash away the sin of Israel and he's going to do it because they now recognize Jesus as the Messiah and God will remove all of the idols from the land. And you read verses 4 through 6 and you will learn that there will never again be another false prophet. And in verse 8, you have the detail of how God saves Israel, but he saves only a part of Israel. And this is really helpful for us to get our minds around. It will come about in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts of it will be cut off and perish. They won't just be cut off, they will be cut off and they will perish. But the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as with silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. So one Jew and three will be saved. That's really sobering. But their salvation will involve a severe testing and they will show the genuineness of their faith by how they persevere through that testing. Verse 9, they will call upon my name. They will not resort to their own strength and their own wisdom. They will call upon my name. I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say Yahweh is my God. That's what happens in verse, chapter 13. Chapter 14 describes Jesus' victory over all of the nations that are opposed against his people. 
And what we see there is that Messiah is exalted. But notice the desperate state of Israel at this time. You see that chapter 14, verse 2. I will gather all the nations together to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Verse 3, then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations. Just in case we're not convinced that this is Jesus, cross-reference this with Revelation 19, verses 11 and 14, 11 and 15. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Revelation 19, 15. From his mouth comes a sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So that's what takes place at the end of that, that age is that Jesus accomplishes victory over his enemies. And the book ends just as history on this earth will end with Jesus ruling the earth. Revelation 14, verse 9. And Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be the only one and his name will be the only one. Those are the words that are comforting words for Israel. God is saying to Israel, be comforted. You have very difficult times ahead, but I am jealous for you. I will set you apart. I will give you your land back. I will protect you. I will purify you. I will remove sin from your land. And I will give you your Messiah. And you will recognize him for who he is. That he is my son. And he came and he is there to rule over this earth. That is so encouraging for the Jew. But this is also encouraging for the Gentile today who believes. For the Gentile who believes, they'll still be alive in that same place. They will be alive and reigning alongside Christ with the Jew in that time. So that's exciting. So the encouragement for us today is persevere and be faithful. Run hard after your faithfulness to God and in so prove it in persevering to the very end that you are indeed his son or his daughter. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this book. I thank you for its detail. I thank you that you cared about us so much that you gave us detail as to how it is that your son will come again how it is that he will be exalted and he will rule on the earth. Lord, and in that day he will be king over all of the earth. And Yahweh will be the only one and his name will be the only one. I pray for us today that we would know this truth, that we would love this truth. We would know that you are a God who is faithful to your covenant. You remember your covenant with your people. And we would run hard after holiness of life. And that one day there will be a resurrection from the dead for all of those who know Christ. They will be resurrected into fellowship with Christ and they will rule together with him on this earth. Oh Lord, may we run with faithfulness towards that. I pray for us this week, Lord, that whatever it is that you have for us, whether it's work or family or fellowship, difficulties, Lord, that you would grant us your grace to run after these things with eternity in view. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.